Welcome, friends and colleagues, everybody in the room and uh, on the Zoom and all the ships uh, in the sea or whatever the saying is. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest, Eric Bruff. I know that all of you from your different diverse disciplinary backgrounds can probably think of people in your field who are kind of well-known in the field, who kind of have a good reputation. Uh, they're just a known quantity. Maybe you might even call them a living legend. Uh, well, that's kind of how Derek is. I, I'm not speaking specifically of his disciplinary background necessarily. I don't really know much about that. That's mathematics, by the way. <laughs> but I'm talking about in the field of what we do here at CAT plus FD, right? Faculty development, educational development. Uh, he is well known in that field. Uh, if you mention his name, People know who you're talking about. To the point that when our director, Elizabeth, went on a nationwide quest <laughs> to re-examine the role of Pat plus FD here at Xavier, uh, she knew she had to make a pilgrimage to Vanderbilt to visit Derek. That's where he was at the time, director of the center there for many years. I remember we have a big conference for faculty development. Uh, the first year that I went, I stayed away from any session on technology. But on the second time I went, I was drawn in by a session that Derek did, and he rekindled my interest in that field. So uh, since then, uh, he has struck out on his own. Now, there's not a lot of people in educational development who strike out on their own. So you know that we are very lucky to have him here with us today. So thank you so much, Derek, for coming here to Xavier University of Louisiana. I'm gonna turn it over to you and say thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bart, that very kind introduction. Thank you. Quite honored, quite honored. Let me, um... Oh, there goes the, the zone. There we go, okay. Um, Thank you for being here. And again, thank you for that kind of introduction. Um, I, think, I think we first got connected around 2007, 2008, because both of our teaching centers were doing podcasts in the early days of podcasting. And we connected around that. And so I'm very glad to be here in person and get to visit the campus and, and get to know some of the faculty. So I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'm here as part of this AI series. Um, as Bart indicated, I was at the um, Vanderbilt University Center for Teaching for a long time, worked with faculty all over campus in a variety of capacities. Um, one of my areas of interest was around technology and technology use in education. And while I'm always excited to have technology make our lives a little bit more efficient or a little bit easier, I'm really interested in the ways that technology can create new and different learning experiences for our students. And so that's what I like to spend my time thinking about. And so um, when uh, ChatGPT uh, came on the scene uh, just over a year ago, um, I was uh, had some time to think about what exactly we might be able to do with this. And so it's been an ongoing and evolving set of conversations that I'm excited to be a part of. And I hope today I'll leave you all with some new ideas or new perspectives or new things that you might implement in your teaching um, related to generative AI. Um, a couple of bits of business. Um, on the slide, you'll see my website, DerekRuff.org. You can find out more information there. Um, I do a mostly weekly newsletter and a podcast um, on uh, intentional, called intentional teaching. I've also made my slides available. So if you go to isgoodis.gd slash Xavier AI, you should get access to my Dropbox where you can uh, take these slides. I have a lot of links and references in the notes field of the slides in particular. So if there's stuff you'd like to follow up on, you've got that option. Okay, so uh, let's jump in. First, um, I, I know that people are coming at this topic from different perspectives. So I'm gonna do a little bit, a very little bit of kind of laying the groundwork. Um, ChatGPT is the generative AI tool that took uh, our world by storm in November of 2022. Um, uh, I think um, having a new transformative technology like this come out near the very end of the fall semester was not helpful. <laughs> um, I think a lot of folks were didn't have the time in uh, December and January to kind of uh, make sense of it. Um, but it also um, 
does things that we often ask our students to do, and it does them passably well, sometimes excellent. Um, so if you go to ChatGPT or one of the other generative AI tools that work with text, and you ask something like, what does the phrase the good, the bad, and the ugly refer to? It will give you an answer, right? Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly is a phrase that be, has become a, one I can't see on my screen. A cultural idiom largely due to its use as the title of a famous 1966 Italian spaghetti western, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it has this um, kind of more information than you asked for approach to answering questions. Um, but I think it's important to remember that uh, tools like ChatGPT, they do speak, but they don't think. Uh, they, are, they, are, they aren't really question answerers. What they are doing is they're stringing together words in plausible ways. Um, and they're really good at it, but that's kind of what they're doing. And so I think it's important to have at least, I'm not going to dig into the computer science or mathematics behind this very much, but to at least have a bit of a kind of metaphor for how these tools work. Um, and so I found a really nice set of visualization in the Financial Times several months ago. Um, so if you take a sentence like this, it says, I have no interest in hearing about the rising interest rate of the bank. You can see the word interest there is used in two different senses. There's the interest in hearing, but then there's the rising interest rate of the bank. And so um, what these tools do in a very broad sense is they look at the connections between words that appear near each other in huge volumes of text, great swaths of the internet. So they have tons of textual data to analyze and look for connections. And so you can see that there are connections between there's a there there's interest is sometimes connected with words like no and in and hearing and sometimes it's connected nearby adjacent to words like rising rate and bank and so the model can form kind of some conjectures of sorts and i i don't know of a way to talk about these things without anthropomorphizing them somehow right so is it conjecturing no that's what humans do but um it sees patterns and it can it can then reproduce some of those patterns so if you ask it to complete the sentence the financial times is dot 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 it will generate a variety of plausible completions of that sentence based on the word adjacency patterns that it has familiarized itself with again across terabytes of text and then it will pick the one that seems kind of most probable right and so there's lots of ways to complete the sentence um but it might pick the one that says that Financial Times is a newspaper founded in 1888, right? It, 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 it does that. And so it's a bit like autocomplete on your phone, but it's way better <laughs> and can generate copious amounts of text. So that's a useful mental model, I think, for kind of how these things work. There's a lot more going on with the implementation of the tools, but it is nice to think of them as, I, I think of them as wordsmiths. They are kind of putting words together in interesting ways. Um, they don't know things though. So before I go much further, I'd like to get a sense of how folks um, are using ChatGPT and other generative AI tools. So I'm gonna do a quick poll using Poll Everywhere. So this should allow everyone to respond, whether you're in the room or on Zoom. Let's reveal some responses here. Excellent. No one picked A. <laughs> That's great. Um, I need to, I've asked this question at several different events over the last year. I need to, I need to kind of run an analysis of how this has changed over time. So, um, okay, so we have one A, maybe just because it's not. Um, but, um, no, because it hadn't logged in yet. Well, and I found that, you know, when I asked this six months ago, half the room would say I have, right? So I'm glad to know that most folks have indeed at least dabbled a little bit. Um, and so most of that's the most popular response, but some of you are using them either occasionally or regularly. And so um, uh, would anyone like to share something they're doing either occasionally or regularly that they found kind of useful with these generative tools? I just, <clears throat> I, I have like a list of books for my students to, to consider choosing from, which I've always done and I've always meant to go back and put in some summaries but that just takes long. I just dumped the whole list into chat GPT the other day. It gave me a nice little four paragraphs of all these 40 books or something. Okay. Yeah. Saved me just an hour. And when I picked up, can you repeat them? They were accurate. Accurate enough to be on Yeah. I had to play with it a little bit to write a couple of kind of mini lecture things last year just out of curiosity. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, oh, and hold on. I forgot my rule. What's your name? Tyra Rose. Tyra. Tyra. Yeah. Um, recently, in one of my senior classes, I've noticed that a lot of students contact me about reviewing personal statements, resumes, and like, well, professional development. Sure. Yeah. Development. Yeah. As graduation is approaching or after, so I've built into a class where it's like required for points, go career services, start drafting it. Um, just to make them do it proactively. Mm -hmm. And so for some of them, like if you're getting a little stuck, maybe dump your draft resume and yes. say, like, help me brainstorm a personal statement based on this. If it doesn't sound aligned to your voice, which it probably won't, but mm -hmm. at least it gives you so not more of the like academic scholars. Okay, but, but like professional, professional writing. development, yeah. brainstorming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think one thing that ChatGPT and the other text generators tend to be good at is genre. If you ask it for a letter of recommendation, it's going to write something that looks like a letter of recommendation, right? It, it will often get details wrong, but it gets genre pretty good. Yeah. Mark, anything from the chat? Uh, yeah. Uh, Elliot said that he tried to generate stimulus photos for a study that they're working on. And I asked him, how did it go? Uh, but he hasn't answered yet. Okay. Uh, the pictures were terrible, but I'm pretty pleased with the work. <laughs> okay. Hey. Yeah. All right. So um, it gives me a little sense of what folks have been up to. Go back to the slides here. So I've seen a couple of reactions to the advent of generative AI. <laughs> One is from our friend from the Lego movie. Everything's awesome. It's so great, right? Um, and so I have a quote here. Oh. Try. Should work now. So this is from Mark Andreessen, who co founded Netscape back in the olden days of the internet. Um, we believe we are poised for an intelligence takeoff that will expand our capabilities to unimagined heights. We believe artificial intelligence is our alchemy, our philosopher's stone. We are literally making fan think. <laughs> that seems slightly hyperbolic. <laughs> and again, I would argue it's not thinking, <laughs> it's stringing together words in useful ways, um, which is not quite how we think of thinking. But there are some interesting things. Oops, there we go. There are some interesting things you can do. So um, Elliot mentioned image generation. Um, and so this is a comic book that came out early last year. Um, where the artist plotted the comic book, scripted the comic book, kind of planned it all out, but all the images were generated by an AI tool. I think they used mid-journey on this one. Um, and so the artist would have to give a bunch of prompts to the AI tool to describe the scenes that they wanted to create and often iterate those prompts repeatedly until they were satisfied with the, the image that was generated. Um, <laughs> they were smart to avoid hands in the images, yeah. <laughs> also, I find the main character looks a lot like the actress in Dea. Yes, so I it's, it's a little derivative, right? Um, so, uh, but it's kind of impressive, right? That they were able to kind of coach the AI to do this. Now, one little caveat here. Uh, this artist submitted the comic book to the US Copyright Office for copyright. Um, in the US, you don't have to submit to have copyright in your on your, on your productions, but it's it's helpful in a legal case if you have done that. Um, and the US Copyright Office said this was not copyrighted. It was in wow. fact, uncopyrightable um, because a human did not create the art. Um, I don't know that I would agree with the US Copyright Office on this, but that's one of many strange legal questions that are at play right now. What was used to generate the drone, do you know? I think they used the tool Mid-Journey. Mid-Journey, yeah. Um, so AI can write for, write for you. Um, this was a, uh, uh, from Ethan Mullick's One Useful Thing newsletter last April. Um, he is a business professor who's been doing a lot of work in this area, a lot of writing about this. And so I realize you can't read what's in the text, but look at the back and forth between the human, Ethan Mullick, in purple, and the AI tool in white. He was using Bing Chat for this, which is now called Microsoft Copilot. Um, and it's a similar technology to, to ChatGPT. Um, and so he basically asked for 
he wanted he was writing this newsletter and he wanted a final paragraph that said certain things. And so he told Bing Chat to write a paragraph. Actually, he told Bing Chat to go read his own blog, get a sense of his writing style, and write a paragraph that addresses these points in his writing style. Um. <laughs> and it did so pretty well, actually, right? Um, so in addition to genre, these tools can often get to some degree a kind of tone or kind of language use. They, they can kind of characterize different styles of writing. And so it generated a paragraph. And so then he came back and said, this is pretty good, but can you expand it a bit and end with more advice? And so it came back with a second version. And he said, yes, but can you also mention this other thing? And it came back with the third version. And so this iterative process produced a paragraph that he was pretty happy with using the newsletter. And it sounded like he's right. right? Um, wow. So again, they're good with words, right? And they're, they're good at kind of understanding our words and responding in ways. Um, this was a study that came out of kind of law education. Uh, they, they had law students who were, in this case, they did a, a bunch of different legal tasks, but this graph is for contract drafting. The drafting some fairly standard contracts. Um, and the, the plot is the uh, time distributions with and without AI. And so you can see on the left, the no GPT is the blue. So that, that was kind of the control group. And so the students took a variety of amounts of time, but when they a different group of students had GPT, had the AI, their, the overall distribution of time spent went down, right? So they got a little faster. Um, and on the other side, they were graded by some professors on kind of the quality, and the quality went up a little bit when they had GPT help them out. And so quality went up. So that their summary, we found that access to GP GPT-4 slightly and inconsistently improved the quality of the participants' legal analysis, but induced large and consistent increases in speed. And so I think we're going to continue to find certain tasks where this will happen pretty often where if you're using a generative AI, it'll go faster and maybe improve your quality a little bit. Not all tasks, but certain tasks. Um, one of those tasks is finding research papers. Um, so there's a tool called Illicit that has actually been transforming a lot since I took this screenshot, but its main function is to search a huge database of scholarly publications and find papers that may respond to your questions. And so I typed in, how would I form student groups when using groups during a college class. What does the research say on group formation? And it went and it found scholarly sources from the Semantic Scholar Web, and it gave me this table of results where I could see, here are the papers that might address this. My favorite feature, it'll tell you like the intervention use and the outcomes, it'll try to pull that out of the paper. My favorite is that it will summarize the abstract for you. So if you're tired of reading long abstracts, <laughs> this will give you an even shorter version. Of wow. Long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> All those really long abstracts get tired of reading. Um, and then finally, under this section, ChatGPT can visualize data for you. Um, this is the pro version, the plus version of GPT. So the free version won't do this, but the GPT 4 that you have to pay for will. Um, and so I gave it an Excel file from the old stats course that I taught. It had a bunch of data on, um, it was from the website Rotten Tomatoes. So it had movie ratings by uh, critics and by audience for a whole bunch of movies released in 2013. Um, and so I just gave it the Excel file and said, please describe this data set. And apparently I had labeled my columns well enough and it inferred where it was from. So it told me what was in the data. And then I said, please visualize these data. So it gave me histograms for both the user ratings and the critic ratings. But I really wanted those plotted against each other. So I asked for that and so it plotted the user rating versus the critic rating for each of them. Now, there's a lot of tools that will do this for you. What's amazing, I think, is how easy it was for me to do this. I didn't have to figure out how to do this in Excel or R or any other stats program. I could just use plain language to ask those tools to do it for me. Um, and that's really what changed when ChatGPT had seen, but the interface of these large language models got so much easier to use. Okay, so everything is awesome. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> maybe yeah, everything is just fine. Oh, yeah. Chat, well, please. Uh, Elliot said that Elicit seems like an interesting answer to the you may not use AI in any way, folks. Who cares how students get sources as long as they get good ones? Use them right. 
Yes, and I will add to that, when I have done the same queries for sources for, to both Elicit and to Bing Chat, which is down in those copilot, um, I found better quality sources from Elicit. They weren't always exactly what I wanted, but they were all scholarly sources, and they were closer to what I wanted. Bing Chat would just give me a lot of stuff from all over the web, mm -hmm. and so I had to do a lot more work to kind of vet those sources. So, things are also not good, right? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from last year. A Machine Intelligence Research Institute scholar wrote, if somebody builds a too powerful AI under present conditions, I expect that every single member of the human species and all biological on Earth dies shortly thereafter. So there you have it. <laughs> That's what's coming. Again, perhaps some hyperbole, but I've seen a lot of movies, right? Sometimes this happens in movies. Um, but there are issues, right? You've probably read that AI tools like this will hallucinate facts, it will make up stuff. Um, this was the post from last year where Ted Underwood, who does AI research, posted, terribly sad, and I have to say I'm angry I wasn't informed. He asked Bing about himself, and Bing replied, I see you're interested in Ted Underwood. He's a professor of information sciences and English at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, he passed away on August 28th, <laughs> His home. So he was sad to find out that he had been dead for months. So, um, because again, it's stringing together words in plausible ways. And when you do that with some random elements, sometimes you get random output that's not reflective of reality. So, um, they, uh, the tools are the tools that can search the web do this less, but they still will make up stuff. Um, and like as the tools advance, right, ChatGPT4 is a little better at this than ChatGPT. But based on how they work, they are going to string together words in unexpected ways. Sometimes. There's often the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. Most of these tools were trained on huge parts of the internet, which, as we know, is a place free of bias and <laughs> any kind of problematic thought, right? And so there were some journalists who went to ChatGPT and asked it to um, write per, uh, sample performance reviews for employees in different job categories. What might you say to a kindergarten teacher, a lawyer, a mechanic in their performance review? And they did not specify any gender of these employees, but in ChatGPT's responses, it often assigned a gender through the use of pronouns. So it always assumed kindergarten teachers that use she pronouns. For construction workers and mechanics, it used he pronouns, right? And doctors and lawyers were somewhat mixed. And so the biases that we see in the training data, again, some of the vendors have tried to kind of take these biases out or put in some safeguards. It's better now than it was 12 months ago, but it's going to replicate a lot of what it had in its training data. And so we have to watch out for that. Mm -hmm. There will be inequities. I mentioned that ChatGPT has a free version and a paid version. The paid version is much better than the free version, and it's $20 a month, right? And not all of our students have a spare $20 a month to subscribe to something like this. So we're going to have some inequities. Um, it will also get better. So, um, so I went to the free version of ChatGPT and I said, tell me about the May 2023 Supreme Court decision that dealt with Andy Warhol's art. Um, my wife, the artist, and I were really following this Supreme Court case. And it said, I apologize for the confusion, but as of my knowledge cut off in September 21, I'm not aware of any Supreme Court. It didn't know anything about it, right? Because it was trained on data before. ChatGPT4, however, can go look online and read stuff. And it gave me a great summary of that. And the reason I share this is because I remember doing workshops like this in March and April of last year and telling faculty, one way to get around chat to ET is to ask your students to write about things that happened after 2021, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't know anything about it. A few months later, that was no longer true advice. So everything I tell you today may be incorrect. In I just wanted to put that up. <laughs> and then, okay, this, you're gonna love this one. Okay, I need to share a video here. So we're about to see a video featuring Betsy Berry, who runs a teaching center at Wake Forest University. She did not write this, record the audio or the video. She gave AI a two minute clip from an existing video, a two sentence prompt, and here we are. In a world where technology and artificial intelligence are rapidly transforming our future, there's one thing I firmly believe, 
a liberal arts education will be more important than ever before. As the development of AI continues to reshape industries and redefine job roles, it's easy to get caught up in the hype of technical skills and specialized knowledge. But let's not overlook the immense value of a liberal arts education in preparing us for this radically transformed world. Stop there. What she didn't do, that's, that didn't happen? That did not happen. Uh, so what is, what, a very nice video. So her, so is this thing video does she have on the cigarette? Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like that, right? But the AI wrote a script for her, then replicated her voice and replicated the video so that she was delivering that speech. So she didn't write that. The thing about the video, the video is a little long, right? You can kind of tell from that point. Um, the, the voice, though, that was really good. But I'm not sure I could have told that we didn't know that's how it happened. Yeah. I'm just watching it. I would have thought she had a poor camera. <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or a poor internet connection. Yeah. Right? Like, maybe it's your, your end, right? Probably. Yeah. And if you're watching this on your phone? Yeah. So anyway, everything's fine. <laughs> um, I have another poll, and I'm going to have you guys chat for a minute about this. How would you describe your policy on generative AI right now? So let me go over to poll everywhere. So are you a red light? Are you prohibiting the use of AI? Are you a yellow light permitting the use of AI with limitations? Green light, let's see what AI can do. Or are you a flashing light you're not sure yet? Yeah, Robin made a good point with this. She said that uh, really depends on the class and the assignment. Mm. Robin, I'd love to hear more from you about that. Can we hear Robin? Sure. Robin, Robin would you, you unmute? Would you unmute and share a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I mean, um, yeah. I guess if it's um, if it's a composition class, for example, um, I discourage students from using AI since I'm hoping that they will learn to write um, by analyzing some of the failures of AI that you've already pointed out. Um, with more advanced students, I'm interested to see how they have used it to revise or refine uh, their, their own ideas or their own um, structuring or organization of their writing, so. That makes a lot of sense, right? And where are they in their skill development? Yeah, I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Would anyone else like to explain why they picked their answer? I, I wanted to mention that uh, a year ago, um, I started becoming more aware of it. And I would have said red light a year ago. I, I remember going into my class and I had just gone to one of Bart's first workshops on it. And I said, okay, listen, class, you know, you've probably heard about this thing that's coming out. Um, I'm asking you this semester, please don't try to use it for anything. Uh, I said, I probably will change this in the future, but I just didn't feel prepared to give them any kind of guidance or limitations on it. Now I kind of say, I welcome it under, you know, certain conditions. They need to write a reflection on what AI did, how they used it, that kind of stuff. And so far, I'm okay with that. I'm sure I need to improve on it but it, in a very short period of time i've gone from a red light to a yellow light and you know i'll probably be green light before too long <laughs> yeah this this is the first time i've not got any red lights when I ask this question. mark i've used it in my class what i do is i have a, an essay and so i put the essay prompt into chat gpt and then we look at the response and okay. we then critique the yeah. responses because Generally, half of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it's really important for my students in constructing that to understand why those were wrong and try to help figure out what other items they could have. So I love that because there's a couple of things happening. One is that I'm imagining there are some course specific learning objectives that you're pursuing, right? And, and kind of the feedback that you're, you're having the students generate on what chat to be produced. You're also teaching them about the limitations of these AI tools. Right. Um, and I think anytime you dig into one of these and start asking the questions about stuff you know well, you're going to quickly find where it's, where it's limits. Uh, students um, may or may not take that. 
Yeah. Also, Quincy says that he's a green light in one of his classes. Quincy, do you want to share more about that? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to interject. So um, similar to Robin um, answer, she, she mentioned um, it depends on what class. So I'm actually teaching a class on AI ethics right now. So <laughs> um, it's a pilot course this semester. So we're using all of the AI tools. And I'm so um, happy that you joined us today. I'm so uh, I've, I've been trying to go over some of this stuff, but you're capturing capturing it on such a another level. So I appreciate that. But on this course, on, on um, why well, I said green light for this course, because we use chat GPT mid journey, we use um, Gemini and so on and so forth. And then I have the students use AI, but then they uh, turn around and analyze AI, right? So they, they're almost like um, on top of AI. So we're, you're, we're using AI, but then, okay, this is what AI gave us, but let's think about it critically. So, um, I mean, we, we use AI every, every class period and, and on homework and um, th they're loving it, but I'm getting them to think critically because AI is not giving them the final answer. They are analyzing what AI is saying. <laughs> Yeah. And I love that you're teaching a course on this. I was actually asked by a reporter back in August, do you know of any courses about AI that are happening this year? And in the fall, they hadn't quite hit the curriculum yet, but but you're not the only one teaching a course like that this spring. Um, and I think it's a great way for us as, as academics to explore this space with our students. So um, let's talk about teaching a little bit. Um, we might need to change some of our learning objectives because of generative AI tools. And I'll share a quick story um, from about a decade ago when a tool called Wolfram Alpha came out. And um, as Bart mentioned, I'm a mathematician. I teach math courses from time to time. And Wolfram Alpha is a computational engine. You can ask it all types of math questions, and it will answer it correctly. It's a totally different technology than ChatGPT. It's actually doing the math. And so I was teaching a linear algebra course when this, it's a website. It's just got a box like ChatGPT. It's really easy to use, really accessible. And so I was teaching linear algebra when Wolfram Alpha came out. And there's a certain type of linear algebra question where it's basically a word problem. And students have to analyze the situation, model it with something called a matrix, just a row of rows and columns of numbers, and then do this thing called uh, row reduction on that matrix, which is a very tedious, computationally intensive algorithm you do on a matrix. It gives you some numbers at the end, and then you have to interpret those numbers in light of the original question. And so there's three steps. Model it correctly, do this computational step in the middle, and then interpret the result. Wolfram Alpha was really good at that middle step. <laughs> it would do it quickly and accurately, unlike my students, or me, actually. I'm not, it's, it's just a lot, of a lot of arithmetic in a very particular way. And so on my exam that semester, I changed up my exams where ordinarily I would have given my students one of these questions and it would have taken them, I would estimate 20 minutes of exam time to finish it. Most of that was the computation in the middle that was just arithmetic. So instead I said, you can use Wolfram Alpha. I'm now gonna give you five of these questions on your exam. And so I could actually focus more on the first part of that problem solving process in the last part, the modeling and the interpretation of results which are conceptually much harder. Um, and so it worked well, actually, right? I, it gave me the opportunity to focus on kind of the stuff that humans needed to do, and we didn't have to spend all our time in tedious calculations. And so we're seeing similar things in different fields now with generative AI. So John Warner is the author of the book, Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. The title tells you a lot about his stance on academic writing. Um, and he posted last year, part of the problem is that we have been conditioned to reward surface level competence, like fluent pro prose, with a grade like C plus, B minus, or B minus, or B, B. We may have to get used to not rewarding pro forma work that goes through the motions with passing grades, or it may mean finding other elements of the experience to focus, focus on. Yeah, you like that? For... Good phrase. Good phrase. Yeah, searching about. <laughs> and so, you know, just as I don't grade my students on how they use their calculator to do arithmetic, I'm, I'm, I'm grading on other things, right? So he's arguing that maybe 
yeah, we just assume that you're doing some grammar and spell check, right? So I'm not going to make that a big part of the grade anymore. We're going to focus on argument and audience, logical argument, you know, things like that. Computer science, they had about a year lead on us because the code generating tools came out before ChatGPT. And so now pretty much any computer science homework set from a first or second semester intro to programming course, ChatGPT and these other tools can write that code for you in an instant and get it right. So it's very, very good at writing code. And so Brett Becker and some colleagues wrote in a white paper, we believe this minimally suggests a shift in emphasis towards code reading and evaluating rather than code generation, which is not entirely inconsistent with how computer programming works, because if you are a computer software engineer, you have a whole team of people you're probably building code with, right? And so you're regularly looking at other people's code and making use of it and making sure it works. So these are not useless skills. They're really useful skills. And so maybe it means, and I've talked to some computer science faculty who are thinking about redoing their entire introductory curriculum because of, of these tools. And so that may affect other fields that don't use code, but use words or images. So if that's you, you use words or images in your field, you may have something to think about here. Okay, but we might keep some learning objectives even though AI can shortcut the work. So um, <laughs> this is a different kind of AI. Um, I'm a bird watcher. I started this hobby during the pandemic. My wife and I noticed all the fun birds in our backyard. And so now we regularly keep an eye out for birds. There's an app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Merlin, and it's really good at identifying bird song. So if you walk around and you hear a bird, you can turn on the app, it will listen, and it will try to identify what that bird is. And it's, it's pretty accurate. It's not 100%, but it's pretty accurate. I use it all the time to help me know if there's something I should be looking for, right? If it says there's a yellow-throated warbler in the area, now I can go try to lay my eyes on it and confirm that. So I went to one of my favorite ornithologists. Margaret Rubega is a professor of biology at the University of Connecticut. She is a state ornithologist. She regularly trains students on all types of kind of ornithology bird related stuff. And so bird identification is an important learning objective in many of her upper level courses. So I said, do you allow your students to use Merlin, right? Here's an AI that can do a lot of the work for them. She said, absolutely not. <laughs> the goal is for students to gain skills to advance their careers as professional field biologists. When the bird identification you are doing is data, it is important for you to be able to reach an ID for yourself and to have a sense of how certain or uncertain you are about the ID. Merlin doesn't help them develop that skill, right? So she's like, no, we're not going to use it. Yeah. You're so good. Um, <laughs> there's one thing, and I appreciate you putting her quote there, because one of the things I think about legacy is a very big value for me. Okay. And I learned about kind of like this indigenous principle of the seven generations that we're first was starting Xavier and also starting my family, which says like, our decisions today, we're thinking about the next seven generations. So to the quote about, hey, we're just gonna up and die after all of this abandonment. Right. And it's kind of like, that's kind of the, <laughs> I can see it like, oh, we're all much. We're so used to using the technology for certain things. So yeah. one, of, um, like one of the things that I came up with recently, I was so excited because uh, there was this HBCU Family Development Conference and they were showing us in real time all the things AI could help us with. And some of it I was excited about from the administrative like leadership, okay. emails, letters, evaluation, stuff like that. So I was going to show someone, like, hey, let's put it in and see what it, let's you know, brainstorm some names for this new project. And it was down. <laughs> all right. And I kept putting in the prompt. And yep. I kept putting in the prompt. And it was down. And from a uh, Another research said yeah. um, back to disasters, right? Here, yeah. which were very prone to technology, internet, like all of that. Yep. yep. So yep. it's kind of like to her point, if you don't have the foundational skill and things go awry, which right. things are prone well, to go awry? Let me piggyback on that. Yeah. So when I was at Vanderbilt, I was a little bit involved with a project. Uh, it was astronomy faculty who were working mm -hmm. with the US Navy to create online courses to train sailors in celestial navigation, knowing where you are by the stars. Because the US Navy is so dependent on GPS for navigation, they like if the GPS goes down, no one knows where anyone is. Like you can't sail the boats, right? And it was hard to find people who knew how to do celestial navigation, right? You had to find someone who knew the old way 
to train the, the, the younger people, right? And so this idea of legacy is very interesting, right? Part of what she's doing is making sure that these scholars will be able to continue the skills to the next generation. So. All like to your point, like all the apocalyptic movies was gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> all yeah. the technology. The other thing I want to share, a very different field here. Um, this is actually a project that my wife led. Uh, her name is Emily Baroff. She's a marketing manager for Zondervan Academic. Um, and so she is marketing right now this book called Know the Theologians. So it's a book about Christian theologians over the last two 2,000 years, right? Um, and what she wanted to do was to create some kind of digital swag that if you pre-order the book, you would get your own set of printable theologian trading cards, okay? And so there's Martin Luther and Dorothy Sayers and Julian of something and James Cone, right? And so um, she's using at work this tool called Jasper AI, which has both text and image generation. And she, uh, she worked with a graphic designer, but Emily's job was to try to generate these images of these theologians from across time. And so she would ask the AI tool, you know, um, she had to, one, my, art, my, my wife's an artist, and so she was able to specify that she wanted monochromatic uh, uh, printmaking style images, right? So they all had the same kind of uh, look. But then she had, you know, Martin Luther with these, if you ask AI to generate an image of Martin Luther, it's going to get it pretty right. But it went way off the rails. <laughs> and a lot of other uh, uh, theologians, uh, when I, I interviewed her about I interviewed her about this for my podcast, and she says, AI doesn't think that women are theologians. So there's a group called the Capilo Cappadocian Four, I think, uh, like fourth century theologians. Mark is nodding, so okay. I don't think I made that up entirely. And, and one of them is a woman. And every time she asks the AI for a group of four fourth century theologians, it was one, it couldn't count. It wouldn't do four, but it would always do all men, right? But even other things, like there are certain um, like headdresses or garb or hats that would be very specific to certain theologians, time and place, different orders, different cultures, right? It, it fudged all of that. And so she had to constantly go back and forth with the authors of the book to vet what the AI was, was producing. And so the way I summarize this is that expert AI use requires expertise. And I think that's more and more true. Um, if you're a novice in an area, you can use AI to do some stuff, but it's not gonna be expert level work, right? Until you develop the expertise to get it there. So how can we maybe do that? So how can we use AI tools to enhance student learning even towards traditional goals? Sarah, I have a question. Oh yeah. What if two different people give the same prompt to AI? Would they get the exact same no. I can't promise if it's the same program. No. It because it's generating these things randomly, you and I could give the same prompt to the program and get they may be similar answers or responses, but they're not guaranteed to be the same. It's not like a vending machine where you press the Coke button and you get a Coke, right? It's it's unpredictable in its output. Even if you give it the same prompt tomorrow, it may give you a different answer. So um that's me taking photos of birds, as I like to do. One of the things that I found about photography is that the more I use the tools of photography, the more I'm able to understand the conceptual elements of photography. Composition, light, right? Shutter speed, like the buttons on my camera are things I need some conceptual understanding to use, but every time I use the buttons on my camera, it's helping me develop that conceptual understanding. And so where might this happen with AI? Um, AI can help with the blank page. Um, so this is a quote from Guy Kruger, who teaches writing and rhetoric at the University of Mississippi. Since we've been using AI, I've had several students prompt the AI to write an introduction or a few sentences just to give them something to look at beyond the blank screen. Sometimes they keep all or part of what the AI gives them. Sometimes they don't like it and start to rework it. In effect, beginning to write their own introduction. So we, we know students who can't get started, right? Once they have a draft, they're up and running. Even if they don't use what the AI gives them, it may get them over that hurdle, right? Or AI can help students explore a topic. I asked Bing Chat to tell me about a particular World War II cipher from Japan. I teach a cryptography course sometimes, so we, we deal with ciphers, codes and such. And it gave me a summary, but it also gave me some other questions I might ask about this topic, right? I think that's kind of interesting. 
Or, so I just interviewed Perry Fasihi yesterday morning for my podcast. It's not out yet. She teaches writing at Boston University. This is one of my favorite kind of ways to thread this needle. So um, she's having her students ask ChatGPT for feedback on their writing, but she's doing it in a very targeted way. She's not saying, how can I make this better? Mm -hmm. She's saying, give ChatGPT particular criteria to use to evaluate your writing. Mm -hmm. Like, evaluate the evidence used to support the main argument. Is the evidence relevant, sufficient, and effectively integrated into your writing? And then ChatGPT will try to evaluate using that criteria. And then she'll have the students write a reflection on what they've changed, what they haven't, how did they make sense of it, right? So it's not, she's trying to develop the expertise with the tool, right? So this is the thing she wants her students to get better at. And so she's having ChatGPT give targeted feedback there as a way to prompt the students to kind of metacognitively reflect on that part of their writing. Um, and I won't read all of these, but like you can do clarity, precision, appropriateness of language of style. You can also ask for very assignment specific things to give feedback on. Um, and so I think this is one way to kind of, this is the best example I've seen of using the tool to develop particular skills. I, I mean, I didn't thought of it in such a script. Oh, that's really nice. Is it good, did she find in her podcast, is it good at identifying the main argument or they do students need to put their main argument in there? And it, Pretty much tell oh, it can you. tell the main argument. Yeah. The, and, you know, the more specific the criteria, the more ChatGPT is going to make up stuff and not, not hit the mark. Right. But, and the more general, like evaluating clarity, precision, appropriateness of language and style, it's totally good at that. That's a specialty. Right. It does pretty good at logical arguments. So it'll understand arguments and produce arguments well. So it's, it's, it's going to vary in its quality of the feedback. She actually, what happened was they had a snow day in Boston. And, and canceled classes, which seems like something they wouldn't do in Boston, but they did. And so she was going to do in-class student-to-student peer review that day, but they didn't have in-class. They didn't meet that day. So she, she, she punted and had them have ChatGPT do peer review. Wow. But it was so structured that I think her students got a lot more out of it. Wow. I know we're about out of time. What else do I have? Yeah, I'm going to skip some of this. We've talked about critiquing. I will point out that uh, Jim and I, formerly known as Google Bard, if you give it a prompt, it will give you different drafts. So you can try out different versions of outputs, which is bonkers for a math question. My colleague, Robert, he asked a math question and Google Bard gave him three different possible answers to this math question. So we've had a student evaluate those, those outputs, right? The answers ranged from something with a lot of zeros to 25. <laughs> so it's, yeah, some of them are really bad then. Um, and then uh, this is an example from nursing where you give it an entire case about a patient and you ask it to make diagnoses and then have the students evaluate those diagnoses, right? That's the point. Okay, I've got some other things here too, um, but I know we're out of time, so I'm gonna skip all those. Um, I'll end with this anecdote. I got the chance to speak uh, in the fall at an event hosted by the Women in Technology of Tennessee. They were doing a, an event on AI in the workplace and I got to be the kind of education sector guy on the panel. Um, and I was struck by some of my co-panelists who were out there in various, let's see, who let's see, Rondo's working for a tractor supply company and Shauna's working for Amazon, I think, and the ways they were integrating AI into the workplace right now in various, in, in lots of different ways. Um, and then there was a, a participant at a workshop I did not long after that, Mark Klein, and he said, do we want our students to be able to ethically and skillfully use these tools, which will be required in the work environment, or wait for them to learn on the job where they may not have emphasis placed on skillful and ethical use of them? Yeah. So I think that's my call to you is to dig into this and figure this out together with your students. So thank you for having me here. <laughs>